Weapon Balance. Generally speaking, it's something TF2 does quite well. Most classes have several good options for each of their weapon slots that are all good choices and consistent in their power. But just because the best weapons aren't broken doesn't mean the worst weapons aren't lacking. There's a very large collection of weapons that have fallen behind the pack, either through various nerfs over the years or from the design of the weapon itself. But what if this wasn't the case? What if instead of half the weapons on each class being comparatively bad, every weapon had a firmly cemented place in the game's meta? Well, that's what I want to explore today by providing theoretical rebalances to all of TF2's worst weapons. So here are the rules for not only this video, but the entire series should I decide to continue it. Number one, what I define as a bad weapon is something that is either A, generally agreed upon to be outclassed and not worth using, or B, something that's probably fine but rarely used as it currently exists. You can sit there and tell me that a weapon is technically balanced all you want, but if it's only ever touched by a minuscule fraction of the player base, it's probably a good idea to give people more incentives to use it. Number two, I'm going to suggest fixes for bad weapons only. I'm sure there are several powerful weapons that many people would agree need toned down in some way, shape, or form, but for this series, I'm only focusing on buffs because it's much more interesting that way. Number three, I'm going to make an attempt to give two different ideas for each weapon I'm fixing. The first will be a minor number tweak that keeps the original concept of the weapon intact, while the second will be a lot more open-ended and will probably deviate from what currently exists quite a bit. The reason I'm doing two fixes for each is that people have wildly varying opinions on how much certain weapons or gimmicks need change, so the idea is that you have two options to pick between if one of them just isn't doing it for you. Even though I may not like a gimmick of a weapon, that doesn't mean that nobody does, so I want to make sure that existing weapons aren't just getting erased from the game in case they have their fans. And number four, without loads of gameplay testing, it's hard to get all of the numbers absolutely perfect on the first try, so I ask that you focus more on the general ideas than the specific stats. I tried to make them as close to what I think is balanced as possible, but until you slap those suckers into a real server for a few weeks, it's not the easiest to gauge. Oh, and last thing that I'll note is that all the ideas I've come up with are my own. If another obscure balance mod happened to come up with the exact same thing, that probably just means that the idea is good. So, sorry that's a lot of explanation, but I'd rather not have to sift through hundreds of comments from angry goobers who misunderstood the point of the video. <gasps> okay, let's go. Starting us off, the Baby Faces Blaster is a weapon that most people would agree has some problems. It's not completely horrible, but the punishment you receive from taking damage is absurd. A single pistol shot can erase up to 90% of your boost, which considering the damage required to actually fill the meter is not something that's fun to deal with at all. Combine that with the fact that you have to be super careful not to double jump, and you end up with a weapon that feels like you're walking on eggshells the entire time you use it. So how do we fix it? Well, the easy answer is just to lessen the amount of boost you lose from various actions, so that way there's a slightly higher margin for error. Instead of losing your entire meter from 25 damage, ideally it would take closer to 60. And instead of a double jump deleting three quarters of your boost, we could easily tone that down to a cool half. This is the most straightforward way to make the weapon feel decent to use, since stray chip damage and spacebar miss inputs are the number one killer of this thing. But this also runs the risk of being annoying to play against considering the old design's flaws, so ideally we would completely redesign it to be the aggressive scattergun valve intended it to be. These would be my proposed stats for that route. Boost would still build and function in a very similar way, except instead of only the increasing move speed, it would also increase firing and reload speed up to a maximum of plus 20 and 50% respectively. That is quite the combat buff, so we'd also have to increase the damage required to fill the meter by a bit to compensate, say to 180 total. The downsides also stay pretty similar to what we're used to, but the way to lose boost is to not deal any damage for a little while. How long that little while would be exactly would ideally be calculated in a similar way to random crits, where high amounts of recent damage would make the boost last much longer than spamming pot shots across the map. What this design does is it forces Scout to be aggressive to get the most out of his weapon. When initiating fights fresh, you're at a minor disadvantage due to the penalties, but the more damage you deal, the easier it is to keep chaining more kills. What makes this different from other snowballing weapons, which I personally consider to be poorly designed, is that running and hiding are no longer valid strategies if you want to conserve your collected resource. In order to stay at maximum boost, you have to take way more risks than normal, which could easily put you in a dangerous situation if you aren't careful. Ironically enough, I think this type of high-risk, high-reward weapon is what Valve originally wanted from the Babyface's blaster. It's just too bad they weren't weren't able to balance the original design in a way that's still fun to use. The Backscatter is one of many weapons in the game that can be slapped with the dreaded label of gimmick. Its upsides provide exceptionally niche use that barely exceeds that of the stock scatter gun, while its downsides make play outside of that significantly worse. While I think the core design of the Backscatter is gimmicky no matter how you end up tuning it, there's currently one stat on the weapon that's easily the worst offender in its uselessness. The accuracy penalty not only makes this thing difficult to use when you're not using it as intended, but it also makes the entire point of the weapon nearly moot considering how close you have to be to deal more damage than a standard meat shot. So you're probably 
probably thinking that removing the accuracy penalty would be the best way to go, but I'll do you one better. By converting the accuracy penalty into an accuracy bonus, you now have a weapon that fulfills two different solid niches. If you are behind someone, the range at which you can do the full damage backstab meat shots is effectively extended. If not, you have a scatter gun that trades two shells for slightly higher mid-range damage. This would decentralize the backscatter from relying too heavily on its main gimmick, while also slightly improving its effectiveness should you enjoy the flanking playstyle it promotes. Alternatively, if we deem that tweak to be too versatile, we can instead opt to make it do something like this. A bonus of 10% more pellets per shot enforces its role of being an up-close heavy hitter, and the 4 second speed boost on mini crit kills gives you a bit more reward from getting the drop on someone. I think either of these concepts would work quite well, and really, your preferred change depends on which direction you think the backscatter should be taken. If you want something more versatile at the expense of stepping on the toes of the other scatter guns, an accuracy bonus would probably be the best option. If you like the backscatter's current gimmick and want to enforce it more, though, the increased pellets and speed boost would be the way to go. Either way, this is definitely a weapon that needs some love, so something to keep it on par with the rest of the scatter guns would certainly be appreciated. The shortstop is in an interesting position at the moment, because if you ask 10 different people how good it is, you're probably going to get about 10 different answers. Because of how differently it functions compared to nearly every other scout primary in the game, there isn't really a common consensus regarding how balanced the shortstop actually is. But the fact of the matter is that because of how infrequently I see this thing used, some sort of change is probably necessary. The primary fire is arguably fine enough once you learn how to use it, but the shove is currently completely indefensible. It does one damage, sends enemies nowhere, has next to no range, is completely strafable, takes forever to complete, and worst of all, completely interrupts your reload animation so it's a liability to accidentally use. I am not kidding when I say that removing the shove would actually be a buff to the weapon, because at least then you wouldn't have to worry about misinputting right click and being completely disarmed for several seconds. In order to make the shove anywhere close to usable, we'd ideally have to fix most if not all of these problems, so here's what I've come up with. Immediately we're giving the shove at least 25% extra push force. I don't think it should send as far as air blast, but it should at least put enemies at a comfortable distance away from you. What should be the same as Air Blast is the mechanic that briefly locks enemy velocity, so that way they can't just strafe back into you. I know this can be annoying considering how many people complain about it being on the Air Blast, but if we want the knockback to be anywhere close to consistent, this is a necessary evil. The animation time would be reduced from 1.5 seconds to 1 second and would no longer interrupt reloading, the damage should be increased from 1 to 15 to give it some finish off utility, and you would now be able to hit everyone on a 90 degree field in front of you with each shove. This would require some sort of change in the way that hits are calculated since it currently works the same as melees, but we could use that opportunity to also give it a small range increase. That is a lot of buffs, and it would definitely make the shove a force to be reckoned with, so just to make sure you can't spam it, you'd also need to add a speed and knockback penalty to repeated shoves. Now, keen viewers may have noticed that all of these changes are very reminiscent from the shove in another one of Valve's games, and that is mostly on purpose. Similar to the shove in Left 4 Dead, the shove on the shortstop should be a versatile tool that allows you to get groups of people out of your face, send people off cliffs with actual consistency, and not be a complete liability to the weapon. Alternatively, if we decide that the shove is either completely irredeemable or just too annoying to deal with if functional, we could focus on improving the shortstop's niche of being a scattergun pistol hybrid. In fact, the only changes we would really have to make are modifying falloff values to favor mid-range combat more, as well as replacing the shove with something actually useful, say a 30% secondary cooldown on each kill. Not only would that further hammer in the idea that having a pistol is a redundancy, but it would also give better synergy with the other item in its set. The shortstop already combos pretty well with the Criticola, Mad Milk, and Cleaver, so giving it tangible benefits would aim to make these weapon combos more popular. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm sure you could make the argument that the shortstop is in a fine enough place as it is, but considering the lack of use this thing gets, there is definitely room for improvement. Moving on, scout's secondaries overall are in a pretty good position. There's a pretty diverse selection of weapons to choose from that all function pretty well in their own respects. But there is one weapon that I think could benefit from some changes, and that weapon is... The Winger? Yeah, this one might surprise some people because it does get its fair share of users and seemingly works perfectly fine. The entire point of the winger is that it's a halfway between a mobility tool and a mid-range weapon, doing some of both but not really excelling at either. But when you can already combine the pocket pistol and the atomizer to actually get the best of both worlds, the winger's left in an awkward middle ground that doesn't lend itself well to regular use. Sure, you could argue that its use case differs from the atomizer because it lets you jump like three micrometers higher and freeze up your melee slot, but Scout's melee slot is rarely used as it is, while his secondary slot is one of your most important 
important decisions to make, so I wouldn't mind giving the winger some extra stuff to make it more exciting. As far as a minor tweak goes, the most logical answer is reviving a stat that used to be on the pretty boy's pocket pistol of no fall damage taken on wear. The reasoning is pretty straightforward, it has a niche that's helpful on taller maps, and it lets you make the most out of your jump height without having to worry about the repercussions. But because that'll rarely come into play since Scout has a double jump, I've also opted to buff the clip size from an uncomfortable 5 to an even 6. I don't think that'll affect gameplay a ton, but it would solve many people's OCD, including my own, so it's a worthy change to make in my book. But as nice as those changes would be, they wouldn't really be exciting. If we wanted something that could fit that label, we could do something along the lines of this. The idea here is that the winger effectively becomes a burst pistol. You get three shots that fire incredibly quickly, but after each burst you have to reload, albeit with a faster reload speed. This would make the winger into a pistol version of the soda popper, giving you powerful burst and movement tools at the expense of a sharply reduced clip size. And hey, wouldn't you look at that, they're both in the same item set, so the theming is consistent. I think if the winger worked like this, a lot more people would be interested enough to actually learn it. Right now, it's easily the weakest out of the three pistols, so giving it something to entice people to play with it more would be ideal. Scout's melees are, simply put, a bit of a mess. There are only like two and a half of them that are actually worth using, with the rest either being too situational or just completely useless altogether. But unlike most melees that provide at least some sort of situational utility, the stock bat offers you literally nothing, and like most other stock melees, is easily one of your worst choices for the slot. But here's the thing. As bad as most stock melees are, I don't necessarily think they need changing. Sure, they're a boring and mostly outclassed set of weapons, but they're supposed to act as the reliable standard in the template for the unlockables to follow. It wouldn't make much sense for stock melees to have situational utility when that's not the point of the weapon, but they definitely could use some sort of improvement. So how do you even fix something like this? Well, I have two ideas. The first is to give every stock melee the gunslinger crit ability, where landing three hits in a row deals a guaranteed crit on the third. Not only does that keep the basic damage dealer role intact, it also allows every stock melee to kill every class in three hits, further playing into the reliability aspect. Well, except for the bat, which could only drop a demo man in up to three hits, but you get the idea. The other change we can make to stock melees is a wackier meta change that would also have to be accompanied by adjustments to the game overall, but in our ideal circumstances, I think it could actually work. Basically, in the event that random crits are turned off on the game by default, we let stock melees keep them. Since stock melees are mostly outdated relics of a bygone era, why not play into that by letting them keep an otherwise outdated mechanic? This is the goofier of the two changes, and I don't think it's perfect, but it would solve three of the game's major current problems simultaneously, so I honestly don't even think it would be that bad of a change. So as for now, that's what I'm going to be sticking to for all of the stock melees because I want to keep them uniform, but if a better idea comes along down the road, I'll update my proposed stats then. Back to the scout-specific weapons, the Sandman is, uh, not very good at the moment. You're trading off one of your most valuable resources as scout for the ability to play baseball, and not even that well. Both the ball and the slow effect do next to nothing, and I have no idea why you would ever use this thing as it is. The base concept of the weapon isn't even that bad, it's just too extreme in the downside and not extreme enough in the benefits. So what if to fix it we did something like this? By making the slow effect scale based on the class's base speed and changing the downside to only affect you while you're using the Sandman, you now have a more effective high-risk, high-reward option. This wouldn't make it the dominant force it once was, but I could definitely see more people using this if the slow effect was more consistent you didn't have to sacrifice something as extreme as max health. Oh, and we could also increase the ball damage because having a hype way to finish people off is always fun. But in a game like TF2, things that restrict your movement are frankly just anti-fun. So if we wanted to do away with them altogether, I think the most logical solution is to make it a solid fight starter that still debuffs enemies but in a way that's less annoying. The idea for this rework is that it's a long-range alternative to the fan of war, trading consistent 15 second marking if you can get close, for 3 to 10 seconds of marking if you can hit your baseballs. You might think this would make it a direct upgrade as such, but because of the cooldown on the ball and the duration of the effect, not to mention the fact that I'm fixing it later in the video, I don't think these changes would make the Sandman completely overshadow the fan of war. And even though this would make the Sandman incredibly good, I think out of all of Scout's melees, the Sandman deserves to be in that spot. It's one of his most iconic unlockables and takes a lot of practice to get good with, so the fact that it's complete garbage as it stands is a shame. But whether whether these stats make it too much is definitely up for debate, and it's something that I'll have to leave up to you. The candy cane has a design that's rather baffling to me. While the upside is pretty straightforward and versatile, the downside is extremely uneven in its implementation. If the enemy team doesn't have any soldiers or demos, this becomes nearly a straight upgrade. If they have even a single competent one of either of those though, the candy cane becomes nearly unusable. And because soldier and demo are two of the most popular classes to play in most game modes, you're almost always at risk of instantly dying should you decide to equip this thing. So ideally, the best way to fix the candy cane would make the damage vulnerability a little bit more consistent but a little bit 
bit less punishing. By swapping out the 25% explosion damage vulnerability for a 15 second max health penalty, I think we achieve exactly that. The entire point of the weapon is that it increases your long term sustain dramatically in exchange for each individual fight being slightly harder to win. But I've never liked the fact that the application of the penalty is so lopsided, making your matchup against explosives almost unwinnable while ignoring everything else, so this should help even things out a bit. But as nice as the health pack on kill is, its ability to support your team is very powerful and can be challenging to properly balance. So for the rework, I wanted to make the healing a little bit more selfish so we can get a bit crazier with it. Instead of dropping a health pack on each kill, what if we made the candy cane give a flat health regeneration? By having this function sort of like an amputator for scout where you can pull it out to get health regen that increases from not taking damage for a while, you have a nice way to keep yourself topped off if there aren't any medics on your team. And best of all, if you're willing to go for a melee kill, you can still get the health pack. The downsides are a damage vulnerability while active to incentivize retreating before pulling it out, and a damage penalty because there's no reason a literal piece of candy should do the same amount of damage as a metal bat. I think this design would make the candy cane fall a lot more in line with the rest of Scout's melees design-wise. Most other melees are utility options that grant you something while you have them deployed, so it's always felt odd to me that the candy cane's effects are active constantly. If nothing else, I could definitely see this becoming the flanking Scout's melee a choice though, since you don't have to worry about scrambling for health packs every time you're in critical condition. But either way, a healing-based Scout melee is an interesting concept that I'm sad that it's wasted on what we currently have. The Fan of War is another weapon that falls into the technically fine but severely underused camp, doubly so now that we made the Sandman a superior choice. While being able to mark a high priority target for death if you can get into range sounds like a super useful tool at first, it quickly falls apart once you realize that at the point you're that close to an enemy, scattergun meat shots are almost always going to be more valuable. At least for me, one of the reasons I find it to be such a risk is that compared to the consistency of bullets, you're essentially gambling with melee hit detection. There have been several times I've set everything up correctly only to be screwed over by source and Jank. So to counterbalance this, I think the best easy fix we could give the weapon is to give it the same melee range as the Eyelander. The fact that this doesn't make much visual sense aside, having increased range would not only make hits much more consistent, but it would also reduce the risk associated with getting that close to an enemy. This still wouldn't make the weapon top tier by any means, but I feel like a much wider chunk of the player base would be willing to give the Fan of War a second chance if some of the inconsistencies were ironed out. But that doesn't necessarily solve the problem that marking enemies at close range is still just inferior to meat shotting them, so ideally we'd also give marked enemies an extra debuff. I think the most sensical route to take with the Fan of War is to make it what I like to call a pocket buster. Marking an enemy not only makes them take full mini crits, but it also severely weakens any healing options they'd have immediate access to. This would not only be useful in preventing pocketed soldiers and heavies from out healing your team's damage, which is way too common in pubs, but it would also stop enemies from immediately running to the nearest health pack like a coward. Here's a little icon I even made that could be displayed in your HUD if you got marked. Decreasing incoming healing is a very powerful ability to give to weapons, but in this case I think it supports the intended role of the Fan of War quite well. If you take the risk to get in and mark someone who's taking a lot of fire, that person should not be able to avoid death because they had a pocket medic following them around like a lost puppy. So heal reduction is ideal, at least it was either that or highlighting people through walls, so pick your poison. And finally, we find ourselves at the Sun on a Stick. Often lauded as the holy grail of terrible scout weapons, the Sun on a Stick is almost completely worthless currently. The main gimmick of crits on burning enemies is less effective than just shooting people, and the extra utility of fire damage resistance is rarely noticeable enough to dedicate an entire weapon slot to. So what is one to do about it? Well, if we didn't want to get too wacky, I think the easiest change to make is to change the fire damage resistance to a flat afterburn immunity. This would ideally work in a similar way to the Danger Shield, where you take a single tick of fire damage to not completely destroy flare combos. We can also make the main gimmick a bit more consistent by swapping out the damage penalty for a small damage bonus alongside a firing speed penalty and no random crits. The no random crits is less for balance and more because it's ridiculous that the weapon that has a way to get force crits can also randomly do it. It really sucks the fun out of finally finding a burning enemy when you would have just gotten a crit anyway. The final DPS of this rework ends up about the same, but the extra damage per hit does guarantee that if you do manage to find a burning player, you're pretty much guaranteed to down them in a single hit. As for the complete rework, I thought long and hard about this one. I'd thought about letting your hit scan weapons do afterburn. I'd thought about a launchable fireball projectile. Hell, I'd even considered giving this thing a ring of fire similar to that of the Huo Long heater. But I think the final version that I landed on was sufficiently cement the sun on a stick as Scout's de facto damage based melee. So here's what I've come up with. Essentially, we keep the crits on burning enemies, but we also make the first hit inflict the gas debuff. In exchange, hits against non-burning enemies only do half damage. Even though these stats are simple at first, the 
amount of flexibility this would give the weapon would be huge. One hit allows you to follow up with your primary for easy damage over time, two hits gets the damage over time started immediately but with slightly more risk, and three hits lets you absolutely destroy your target if you're still in melee range. This would make the new Sonata Stick a Swiss army knife, letting you follow up in a variety of ways depending on how risky you wanted to play. Now yes, I know what you're probably thinking. Great blue, this would just make the Sun on a Stick a better version of both the Boston Basher and the newly balanced Stock Bat. And while yes, I do think it would overlap a bit with one of my Stock Melee rebalance ideas, I'd still argue that the use cases for it and the Boston Basher would still be completely different. The self-damage from the Boston Basher opens up a pretty big world of opportunities, letting you farm uber for your medics and jump slightly higher if you have overheal. The Sun on a Stick would trade that utility for more points in the raw damage department, meaning that while they have similar functions on a surface level, neither would be completely obsoleted. The Sun on a Stick was a very difficult weapon to rework, because there is frankly not much to work with. But out of every rebalance idea I've ever seen for the weapon, I think this is my personal favorite, and I'm proud of it. So that's all the weapons that I wanted to do the full rebalancing procedure with, but there are a couple that I think are mostly fine as they are, but could certainly use a small tweak. The Bunk Atomic Punch is a severely underrated weapon in my opinion, because the chaos and distraction you can cause by either running into the middle of battle or flanking the entire enemy team is incredibly powerful if you're smart about it. But I do agree that it's a bit weak in its current state, especially considering how rare communication is in casual, so my ideal fix would be to remove the slowdown effect after it wears off and to significantly reduce the knockback you take from sentries while you're invulnerable. While I understand that knockback is one of the only ways to counter a scout trying to flank with the bong, the fact that you can be completely shut down by a single well-placed mini sentry is ridiculous, and I don't think engineers should have the power to completely delete flanking strats with no actual human input required. The removal of the slowdown effect is really just a formality because you can mostly negate it by quickly strafing anyway, so this is more to help the weapon be more user-friendly than anything else. The Rap Assassin is pretty much fine as it is, but in order to help the bobble hits feel more consistent, I'd definitely like to see the splash damage inflict some bleed as well. Maybe not as much as a direct hit, but at least something to reward you from hitting someone with its microscopic hitbox. And finally, the Criticola is rather difficult to make both fun to use and fun to play against, but it's not very good, so it could at least use something. And the something I think it should get is a minor reduction in the damage you take, down from full mini crits maybe to like plus 25%. Right now, it is way too easy to die extremely quickly, making the risk rarely outweigh the reward, so bringing them closer in line is probably the way to go. So anyway, those are all of my ideas of how to make Scout's bad weapons good, or at least fun and generally usable. Scout does not have a horrible arsenal as it is, especially considering how consistently strong his secondary slot is, but there certainly are the stinkers, and bringing everything up to the same power level would greatly help the game feel even more dynamic than it currently does. But yes, if you do have any concerns, critiques, improvements, or general appreciation for any of my ideas, let me know in the comments. Contrary to the beliefs of some, I read through most of them on videos like this, and your refinements on my current ideas will hopefully make my future ones even better. And yes, I did promise to make this a series if it does well enough and people like it. I have balance ideas for Soldier, Pyro, and Demo already in my head, so let me know if you want to see it. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like. If you hated this video, you probably grew up on a fish farm, and most importantly, have a good one.